We are already late in starting this debate, so timings are really tight. Uh, please pay attention to them. The next item of business is a debate on motion 12708 in the name of Willie Rennie on finance and the constitution. May I ask those who wish to participate in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Willie Rennie to speak to and move the motion for up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I feel sorry for SNP members. Here was the, here was the big report, long awaited, published in a flurry of breathless press releases. Members were champing at the bit to debate it at their conference. But after the long bus journey to Aberdeen, discovered it wasn't even on the agenda. But, but I, I am generous. I am here to help. We have carved out time today so SNP members can have their say, to tell us what they really think, to let off steam. It could be quite a cathartic experience. <laughs> the Scottish Growth Commission is a substantial piece of work. The SNP members would love me to stop there, but they don't know what's going to come next. It admits how challenging an independent Scotland's finances would be. It's a confession. It's the best case. It's not of many great choices. It's the stark reality. This is not some flimsy report easily dismissed. It's in the words of the First Minister's own close advisers. The First Minister herself described it as a blueprint. It's a significant development and it deserves scrutiny in this parliament. Liberal Democrats oppose independence and this report, I believe, strengthens our case against independence. On the currency, on the volatility of the economies of small countries, on the, def the deficit, on the years of financial pain, that financial weakness is a direct threat to our National Health Service. It is that serious. Not just now. Let me go through some of the evidence, because I'm sure SNP members will want to hear this. In 2014, I, I warned the economies of small countries are prone to greater volatility. It was denied then, but it is now being confirmed by the Commission. Here's the section, B8.33. It says the greater volatility that small economies can experience also strengthens the case for fiscal conservatism. Mm. Then I warned that an independent Scotland could not demand control of the pound. It was furiously denied. Excuse me, excuse me, Mr. Rennie. By the excuse me, Mr. Rennie. Yeah, I can understand why this is a, quite an emotive subject for everyone. <laughs> But I really would like to hear what Mr. Rennie's saying. So if we could have a bit of murmuring and less shouting, that would be useful, <laughs> Mr. Rennie. The louder they shout, President Officer, the happier I am, I have to say. <laughs> Scotland's government would cede effective sovereignty over monetary policy, says the report in C1.5. I warned that oil was volatile, falling and could not be relied upon. This is now admitted by the Commission. The report says oil should not be depended upon for recurring annual commitments. I warned that Scotland could lose the annual UK Barnet dividend of around £9 billion. Angrily refuted then, now agreed by the Commission. Not only has this gone, but an independent Scotland would be paying money to the UK for years after we'd left. Who's heard that before? 3.139 in the report states the annual solidarity payment is modelled at around £5 billion. That's £5 billion being paid to the UK. Goodbye to the Barnet dividend. I warned that there would be spending cuts denied in 2014, now admitted by the Commission. A 6 to 7% Fiscal deficit is not sustainable and action will be required to reduce it to more sustainable levels, states B4.32. 
Figure 12.2 in the report makes clear that spending in an independent Scotland will be 1% less than GDP growth. So GDP growth of 1% or less would result in real terms spending cuts. Over the last decade, Scottish onshore GDP showed average real growth of just 0.8% per annum. The latest forecast from the government's own fiscal commission published last month is for GDP growth to 2023 to be running at 0.9%. Looking back and looking forward, an independent Scotland would be facing cuts. In fact, it would last for 10 years, according to the report. We then anticipate a period of between... This is the, this is the government's own report. They should be listening to this. We then anticipate a period of between five and 10 years to put the public finances on a sustainable footing, states 3.201. Now, this is not just my interpretation. David Phillips from the Institute of Fiscal Studies confirmed. It's a continuation of austerity, he said. If public spending growth is 1% less than GDP growth, that's austerity. Even independent supporters themselves are saying that. Jonathan Shafi admitted it, it would open the door to various forms of austerity Mr. politics. In his last minute. So in short, in short, an independent country would face at least a decade of pain with cuts to public services without the backup of significant oil revenues. It would have no control over its own currency with an economy that was prone to greater volatility. Liberal Democrats are opposed to independence and always have been. The Commission confirms why we were right to oppose independence in 2014 and why we are determined to stop it now. All of the things that I want to achieve for Scotland, a country where we invest in people through education and mental health, where we champion science, innovation and research, where we take seriously our obligations to future generations and the environment, where we treasure individuals' freedoms and liberties, all of that can be better achieved by Scotland, rejecting the nationalist case and the cuts and restrictions it imposes on our country. I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I now call Derek Mackay to speak to and move Amendment 12708.4 for up to five minutes, please. I move the amendment in my name, presiding officer, and let me say, first of all, that the timing of this debate is very appropriate, coming just hours after the shameful contempt shown to the devolution settlement at Westminster last night. Let us... Let us for a moment... That's let enough. us for a moment... Excuse me, Mr Mackay. Enough, please, Mr Stevenson. That's not like you at all. <laughs> no. I understand, as I said, that this is emotive, but it would be useful for all of us to be able to hear what contributors are saying. Mr Mackay. Well, presiding officer, you know, the unionists may be able to shut us down in Westminster, but they will not shut us down in Scotland's <laughs> parliament. If we can spend a moment of reflection on Scotland's current economic performance, a record year for foreign direct investment, rising employment and record low unemployment, goods exports increasing by 12%, the fastest growth of any part of the UK, and the RBS Purchasing Managers Index reporting private sector growth in Scotland last month was stronger than the UK as a whole. With high employment, a highly educated population and innovative companies that export around the world significant natural resources and huge renewable energy potential, just some key fundamentals of the Scottish economy. But if we look at what small successful advanced economies across the globe have got that we have not, there is only one answer, independence. <laughs> yes, we have the potential to become one of the most successful countries in the world. 
Now, the, the Sustainable Growth Commission report is first and foremost a report to my party, and I warmly welcome the debate that's generated. It is, after all, about choices. It sets out how the London-centric UK economic model has failed and how we could grow our economy, tackle inequality and match the performance of the world's most successful advanced economies. It explicitly rejects the austerity policies of the UK government because, because austerity is the price of the union, not independence. And it is clear to those who have read the report, tackling the inherited financial position can be done with public spending rising. Yeah. Remember the current notional deficit is a product of the current constitutional position, not Scotland as it could be. Recognising that the UK is increasingly unequal in individual and geographic terms, we can, with all the tools of an independent nation, would have improved productivity, participation and population. We can reduce both poverty and gender inequality, the right thing to do in their own right, and bring massive economic benefits to our nation. And having just launched a new national performance framework on Monday, we know just how important well-being is. The happiest nations in the world are those with the least inequality. And it's clear that UK control doesn't suit our economic or social needs, with population a case in point. As Finance Secretary, I've set out how, even within devolution, how three key areas could make a positive difference now against austerity, Brexit and caps on immigration. But unionist parties keep telling us to hold on, holding Scotland back from what we could truly achieve. Excuse me, Mr Mackay. Look, my eardrums are starting to get sore here with all this nonsense going on between benches. So can you please just have a bit of respect for each other and let Mr Mackay finish. Mr. Presiding Mackay. officer, a migration policy designed in Scotland and for Scotland would welcome people with open arms, not throw up barriers. The hostile environment of the UK government is failing Scotland's economy and our public services. And I repeat the calls to the UK government, stop damaging our economy and give us the powers to fix your mess. Yeah. Dogmatic, <laughs> dogmatic unionism may not be able to see any upsides to Scotland controlling our own fiscal policies. But this is a serious debate. We're settling for more of the same. UK control just isn't good enough. Every promise made to Scotland broken, devolution downgraded, Brexit imminent against the will of our people and our economic potential in a fiscal straitjacket. That's the consequence of Westminster control come with to more course, to come. But there are paths open to Scotland rather than simply continuing and repeating the failing UK economic you model come and expecting close, different results. I say to unionists, too wee, too poor, too stupid, won't cut it this time round. Scotland is ambitious. Scotland deserves close, better. Please. Scotland can be better. We will have that debate and we are determined to win it. Right, that's, that's enough. Can I say to everyone, we're seriously pushed for time here. We're going to end up losing speakers or cutting them right down. Can I also take this opportunity to say to everyone in this chamber, I expect respect to the chair at all times. And I call on Murdo Fraser, please, to speak to and move amendment 12708.1. Thank you, presiding officer. Can I just start by thanking the Liberal Democrats very sincerely for giving us at Holyrood an opportunity that was denied to SNP members at their conference at the weekend to debate the SNP's Growth Commission. And isn't it remarkable? They've all turned up. The SNP yeah. benches are full yeah. for this debate. Yeah. How quickly they've forgotten the First Minister's message at the weekend to stop obsessing about independence because it's the only thing they care about, it's the only thing they want to talk about yeah. is they come to the chamber to talk about yeah. this. Now, there's no time this afternoon to debate the entirety of the Growth Commission uh, report. And I'm sorry if that is the case. We cannot do justice to the whole 350 pages of what Alex Salmon's former advisor, Alec Bell, described as a political suicide note. And there's been a lot of praise 
for our former colleague Andrew Wilson for his authorship of the report. And Mr. Wilson is indeed a credible figure and, and put a lot of work into this publication. It's rather unfortunate, therefore, it contains a number of schoolboy errors. One whole section has been lifted straight from a New Zealand Treasury paper without any referencing. And despite the plaudits this report has received in some quarters, it is nevertheless riven with errors, making it a less than credible prospectus for an independent uh, Scotland. Uh, presiding officer, it's hard to know whether to be outraged or simply disappointed by the Growth <laughs> Commission report. But we should welcome the fact that this paper now represents a total repudiation of the 2014 prospectus yeah. for independence. Yeah. The white paper on which that re referendum was fought is now exposed as a compendium of inventions with its ludicrous overstatement of future oil revenues and the optimistic gloss put upon public finances. And it would be good to hear this afternoon an apology from the SNP benches for their attempt to hoodwink the Scottish people just four years ago. So let me just give a few examples uh, in the growth report and quote from some other better qualified people about what they've said about some of the proposals. Because in terms of currency, this is a report that proposes indefinite sterilisation with a move at some future undetermined point towards a separate Scottish currency. And yet the experts are clear this is simply not workable. Yep. Jeremy Peat, former chief economist at RBS, said in 2014 that using sterling out with a currency union would be wholly implausible, dangerous and unlikely to be optimal. Paul Krugman, the Nobel Prize winning economist, called sterlingisation very dangerous. There's even been criticism from within the SNP's own ranks with the former MP George Keravan, who fancies himself as a bit of an economics expert, stating this would lead to an independence campaign, and I quote, covering the same sterile ground as last time and slamming Andrew Wilson as being dangerously naive. And the SNP's favourite economist, Richard Murphy, said the Growth Commission's currency plan was devastating and gave five reasons why it would fail. And it's not just on currency that it falls short. The proposals for public finances propose accepting JERS as a starting point for independent Scotland, austerity max, austerity on a scale this country has never seen, 27 billion pounds worth of austerity over 10 years, meaning massive tax rises and spending Mr. Cuts. Fraser's in his last This seconds. is exactly what's why so many on the left, why so many who are part of the Yes campaign in 2014 have rejected the Growth Commission's proposals. And let us never again hear from a single member on the SNP benches bleating about Westminster austerity. What they are proposing is many times worse yeah. compared to anything we have seen in the past. But anyway, officer, we have a very simple addendum to the Liberal Democrat motion today, making what, just one point. We do not want a second independence referendum. It is not wanted by the Scottish people, not now and not in the near future. It would divide the country as it was divided in 2014. But this whole debate, the you publication of the Growth peace. Commission report itself, is a distraction from the important business of government to get on with a day job. We know it's the only you thing they care close, about. Please, Mr. We know Fraser. it's the only thing they care about, presiding officer, but the government needs to get back to the business of government and not talking about independence. I have pleasure in moving the amendment in my name. I now call James Kelly to speak to and move amendment 12708.2. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I move the amendment in my name. And can I start by thanking Andrew Wilson and also Derek Mackay, his co-author of the report, for laying bare the fact that independence would be a disaster for Scotland. <laughs> the reality is, Deputy Presiding Officer, that it's not a growth commission, it's a cuts Absolutely. commission. It would pile the pain on to Scotland's community and bring the country to its knees. Look at what the report says. It says it acknowledges, it acknowledges the reality of the GER statistics and the fact that we've got a £10 billion deficit. The difference between uh, what, we, what we spend and what we take in uh, in tax. And that would mean, and this is what the report says, 10 years of cuts in order to reduce that deficit. No, thank you. In order to reduce that deficit down to 3% of GDP. And the reality of that means that public services would be decimated. You can't deny that on those benches. 
And the other thing is, there's a supreme irony here then that the Liberal Democrats have brought this debate today, because it's a debate that the SNP don't want. You had, they had absolutely no mention. <laughs> Okay, that's enough, please. Enough, Mr. Right Arthur. All, enough. Please right carry on, all Mr. Kelly. Behind Derek Mackay today to be cheerleaders for independence. But up at the conference at Aberdeen, they were as quiet as mice on the, on the cuts. No, no, thank you, Mr. Mackay. Why don't you go back to Aberdeen and start the, start the debate you didn't have at the conference? Because the reality is, the reality is the SNP didn't want to expose the divisions that there are in their party over, over independence. There are those, there are those who would have an independence referendum every week, and there are those who want to shut their eyes and ignore the facts uh, of the Cuts Commission report. And as they do, the naval gazing uh, on independence. The reality is they turn away from the reality of what's going on in the country. They ignore the core issues. Any MSP worth their salt knows that the main issue that's raised with MSPs is the NHS. Constituents not able to get appointments on time. Some not able to get GP appointments. Well, this government makes assertions on, on housing, the reality is there are 150,000 on Stewart, council house waiting lists. And there are people not far from this, this uh, parliament sleeping homeless on the street. What a scandal. Yet the people on these benches would rather discuss, rather discuss independence. What is needed, Mr. What is needed Mr. Coming Mr. McKay, to is a real debate and a real plan to transform the, the fundamental issues, to grow the, the wages that are stagnating in Scotland. But of course, we didn't hear any mention of the living wage in the Cuts Commission report. Maybe that's because you didn't even discuss it with the trade unions. No social justice at the heart of that Mr. report. Kelly's and summing closing. up, Deputy Presiding Officer, Scotland doesn't want another referendum. It's time to bin the Cuts Commission report and bin the idea of a second referendum. It's time for a radical rethink. Stop the cuts and let's invest in our communities. Can I have some quiet, please? Can I have some quiet, please? And I may as well warn you all right now, speakers are probably going to have to have time taken from them because of all the interventions. Now, can I please call Patrick Harvey, unintended interventions, that is, Patrick Harvey, to speak to and move Amendment 127068.3. Thank you, and I'm, I'm sorry, Deputy Presiding Officer, I didn't realise we were playing to today's debate for laughs. I came here to debate and to challenge the SNP's Growth Commission. We do so even in the context of a warning from the Liberal Democrats about an extended period of economic pain. This from the political party which put the Conservatives into power and helped begin the austerity project itself. Look, my re reaction to the Growth Commission has to begin with the long-standing green critique of growth economics itself. The idea of everlasting economic growth in a finite world and a fragile ecosystem that's already under extreme pressure. But even while it lasts, even while it lasts, growth alone tells us nothing about how fairly the wealth is being shared in our economy or how unfairly the social and environmental burdens fall. And I contrast that with some of the words in the National Performance Framework, launched this week, as Derek Mackay mentioned, and the First Minister's comments in launching it, quoting the famous words of Bobby Kennedy, that growth alone measures everything except what makes life worth living. Well, the performance framework places emphasis on well-being, equality, health, human rights, the quality of our environment, yet it still places economic growth at the core, and the Growth Commission fails to go even as far as the NPF. There is a clear mismatch between these two ideas 
of the economy, a contradiction that lies at the heart of SNP economic policy. But look, even aside from the absence of green economics in the Growth Commission report, there are other serious concerns that remain. During 2014, we set out our reasons why we thought a currency union was an unconvincing proposal for an independent Scotland. It would have left a complete lack of monetary and macroeconomic control. To say that sterlingisation gives rise to the same concerns would be an understatement. It's even possible that sterlingisation itself would prevent the kind of economic agenda that would allow Scotland to meet the Commission's own tests for beginning the move toward an independent currency. For anyone supporting independence out of a fetish for flags, this kind of issue might be of little concern. I have never been one of them. For Greens, if independence meant a version of conventional economic policy decided here instead of London, we would have very little interest. No, independence must, if it's to be a compelling proposition, be a project of economic transformation to a more equal, more ecological, and more humane economy as we embrace the post-oil age. That is the agenda the Greens have set out, and it contrasts with that which the Growth Commission itself has published. We, I don't have time in four minutes. We will continue to set out that agenda even before independence. The demand, for example, for a specific net zero carbon target on the face of the climate change bill is one current example of the kind of transformation, the kind of determination that Scotland must show right now to our future direction of travel. So, presiding officer, I welcome the publication of the Growth Commission report, not as a proposition to fall in line behind, but as an invitation to contest the ideas it contains, ideas which need to be contested. Finally, I have to say how surprised and disappointed I was to see a, a motion today from the Liberal Democrats headed Finance and Constitution, which says nothing, not one single word, about the most immediate and urgent financial and constitutional threat to Scotland. The Liberal Democrats say they want to oppose Brexit and all of the self-destructive chaos that it's bringing, but not one word about it. That's why my amendment ends with a recognition of the positive economic, social and environmental policies that Scotland could be putting into practice as a full independent member of the international community and the European Union. And I move that amendment. Thank you very much. I call Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by Ivan McGee. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I just want to take a moment. Um, members sedentary throughout this debate have made reference to some suggestion that it's only ever the unionist parties that ever reference independence. I want to take that head on because, frankly, I'm not having it. The thing is that the calculations, the calculations of this governing party on the appropriate time to push the button on a second independence referendum caused the oxygen starvation of nearly every other issue of public policy. It's why we have to have debates like the one we just had on mental health, on the treatment waiting time guarantee, on farm payments, on the attainment gap. Independence and the calculations around IndyRef2 are the centre of gravity which suck all oxygen from every other debate in this parliament. So yes, we will keep raising it to insist that this government take it off the table once and for all and get on with the business of service delivery. I do not have time. I also want to say a word about the tone of the government benches tonight. Now, the, the laughter and the derisory comments may give you and your benches some comfort, but there are people on the margins of this debate around the country who it absolutely repels, and you will lose as a result of it, and I am glad of that. I'm glad of the Growth Commission. I'm glad of the Growth Commission. I never thought I'd say that. I'm not going to take an intervention. I don't have time. In all the years that it was talked about and mythologized in hush reverential tones. I am glad of it because when it was finally published within hours, it was revealed for the unforced tactical error that it has been shown to be. And one that I believe has fundamentally hold any economic case for independence below the waterline. So thank God for it. And it was mythologized by the Yes campaign. It was there to win over no voters, pesky no voters still clinging to our facts. You know, and there we are, getting it right. They, they, we were worried about it. We thought, what have they got up their sleeve? But when it was finally published, I thought, goodness, wow. It's not what have they got up their sleeve, it's is that it. 
It took a little while for incisive analysis to come forward. It, there were some uh, usually ardently pro-UK journalists talking about interesting comparisons with Hong Kong and with New Zealand, and that must have lit the touch paper because guns were suddenly drawn within the yes camp. And why the left within the indie camp didn't like it, and we've just heard some of the reason why from Patrick Harvey, because it represented austerity on steroids. The highly respected think tank, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, pointed rightly to the fact that austerity is classified, I will not take an intervention, that it is classified that when austerity um, is, is when 1%, the, when G, growth, G, no, this is, the number of bits, the GDP, uh, when one public spending dips 1% below GDP, that is austerity, by the Growth Commission's own assumptions, it would by necessity have to dip 3% below GDP. Such are the admissions of the economic case or lack thereof for an independent Scotland. So no wonder there was no mention of it at the SNP conference. I think it's astonishing, presiding officer, to, that the government even in its own amendment seeks to delete the fact that the parliament notes the growth commission. If the government win the day this afternoon, we're not even going to know it existed in the parliamentary <laughs> record. Such is their embarrassment at what it reveals. Last week, a social attitudes survey revealed that 59% of our fellow countrymen feel strongly British. I absolutely, that warms my pro-UK heart because finally it might start to loosen that constitutional knot which has stifled debate around any public policy. Now Keith Brown may believe he has a mandate on his election for Indy Ref 2. We will fight that every step of the way and Liberal Democrats will oppose it at every stage of the constitutional process because I am an internationalist. I believe in political unions when you are geographically close to people and when you share their values and I believe that the best days of the United Kingdom do still lie ahead of it. Thank you. Can I just encourage members to keep it down a little bit? You're chatting incessantly over the member, and I can see members who are still to contribute are asking how long they've got. Well, I'm afraid the tail end speakers will probably get less than their four minutes just because of the length of time it's taking to get through these contributions. That's enough, Mr. Finlay. <laughs> Ivan McKee to be followed by Alexander Burnett. Ivan McKee. Thank you, President Officer. President Officer, before I came into this Parliament, I used to work in business and travel the world. And I spent a lot of time living and working in small, independent countries. And I always used to ask myself, why is it that these countries did so much better than us? Higher standard of living, less inequality, and they had far less natural resources than us, and far less qualified people than we have with five of the top 200 universities in the world in Scotland. Well, the Growth Commission report now provides that answer. It explains that empirically over the last 25 years that those small countries have got growth rates 0.7 percent on average per year higher than larger equivalents and it explains the reasons for that it explains the global trends that drive the advantage in trade terms towards those size of countries no i'm too busy and it explains um, and explains why those sized countries are more efficient and more effective at managing themselves growing their economy and providing efficient public services. And the Growth Commission, it's absolutely true, and the Growth Commission also shows the path forward how Scotland can get from where we are now, suffering under the union towards the situation that those small countries enjoy. It lays out the 50 recommendations that we need to follow. It shows the path for growth through increasing population, increasing participation, inclusion in the workforce, and increasing productivity. And it shows the issues that what we can do now, it shows what we can do with more powers under devolution, and it shows what we can do with the full powers of independence. And it shows that path forward for where we need to go from where we are now to where we need to be to realise the full potential of this country of ours. And let's be very clear, the Growth Commission report rejects austerity. It talks about growing the plans to grow the economy by half a percent, 0.5 percent in real terms, to grow public spending by 0.5 percent in real terms over 10 years. Five growth in real terms in public sector spending. Compare and contrast that with what we've seen over the last 10 years of true Tory austerity, a cut of 9%. Minus 9% is austerity, plus 5% is the opposite of austerity. Let's get that clear right at the start. The report is also very clear and it calls for a cross-partisan working across parties, across society, across industry, across everybody that's involved to make sure we realise the potential of this country. And it's very important, I think, that the other parties here realise that and understand what that means means because the reality is we've seen no alternatives coming forward from anybody else as to how we deal with Scotland's situation and how we move it forward nothing at all on the one side we've got Tory austerity more of the same 
power grab, taking powers away from Scotland, limiting our ability to do what we need to do. And we've got that wrapped in the union flag. No thank you. And the other side, the very few of them that have actually bothered the state talk about the future of Scotland and its economy. We've got waiting for Corbyn. Well, I'll tell you something. I've been waiting 40 years for a Labour Party that's going to do something to fix the economy and move us forward. And I'm not going to wait another 40 years because in 40 years, I'll be deep and so will you. And we're not going to see anything. I realised a number of years ago that the only way forward was through independence of Scotland. And that's why I'm standing here today. And this is the future. Where we're going with this Growth Commission report, the debate's happening here. It's happening on the yes side. It's happening with people that are undecided. It's happening across civic society in Scotland. And that's going to continue. Because the reality is, we know where we're going. The Growth Commission report is the future. It's how we're going to take Scotland. We know it. The people of Scotland are increasingly coming to realise that. As we've now, and Wardle Fraser's laughing, but I'll tell him the fact that it's scaring him, scaring him witless as he sits there, is the fact that for the first time ever, the first time ever, the majority of people in Scotland now on polling realise that they would be better off under independence than they are under the Union. That's a fact and that's where we are going. We know it's coming. The people of Scotland know it's coming. This is the future. Get yourself on the right side of history for once. Thank you very much. And uh, before I call Alexander Burnett, could you just suggest to Neil Bibby and Stuart McMillan three minutes rather than four minutes? Three minutes. Mr Burnett, four minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I thank Willie Rennie for bringing this important topic to the Chamber today. Because as much as the SNP like to think that this Growth Commission is an optimistic case for independence, the only thing that it's good for is giving us a blueprint as to why the SNP are out of touch with Scotland. Now, where to begin? I've only got four minutes in which to make a dent in the ridiculous of this, of this report, so let's get into it. As an MSP from the northeast of Scotland, I was interested to see what the Commission had to say on the oil and gas industry. And I was surprised they had something to say, considering they failed to support the industry over the past four years. Whilst the UK Government has provided over a billion pounds of support, yeah. the SNP's token of a transitional training fund has provided little relief to those affected by the oil crash. Now I note they say future projections are not based with a reliance on the oil and gas industry. So instead, I worry how the Commission expects to support the sector if we are to leave the UK. There is much discussion on tax revenues and projections, but no specifics on how they would support the industry. And it's not the only thing they provided little detail on. In fact, there is no mention of the minimum wage, the living wage, benefits cap, food banks, fuel poverty, <laughs> earnings limits, inheritance, tax bans, and absolutely no mention of any policy in relation to the National Health Service. It really will come as no surprise, particularly to constituents of mine in Aberdeenshire West, that the SNP have given no thought to the NHS. And again, they won't be surprised to hear that the SNP will offer tax incentives to those who choose to come and live in an independent Scotland. But if you're already living and working here, there's no mention of what you'll be paying. Now, a government should be in a position where it is able to attract individuals to our country. And we also need to project an image that is favourable to investors. And separation is not the answer. I won't be taking any interventions. If you wanted to debate this, you could do so on your own time rather than be forcing the Liberal Democrats to bring it to the Chamber. Now, I was disappointed, but instead of answering questions on how they would improve investment, productivity and boost our economy, they responded by setting up three new commissions, six new strategies, four new reviews, one new strategy review, and one new standing council, 15 in total. And this only adds to the already cluttered landscape. As the Fraser of Allender says, leading to confusion, a lack of alignment, duplication, and weakened accountability. And if the SNP focused more on the issues at hand, then perhaps they wouldn't be trying to use leaving the UK as the answer to all their problems. Because it isn't, and even the government's own statistics show that, for we trade nearly four times as much with the rest of the UK as the EU. And with more people coming to Scotland from the rest of the UK than overseas, it would be irresponsible to separate from our own nation. So, presiding, I ask this of the SNP government. Focus on Scotland now. Thank you. Thank you. Neil Bibby to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Neil Bibby. 
Thank you, President Officer. As others have said, it is interesting that the Scottish Liberal Democrats have chosen to use their debating time in the Chamber to discuss this report. Not only is it interesting, it is also deeply telling. A report that was put on the back burner for months and when it was finally put into the public domain, it was published over a bank holiday weekend. You have to ask why. It is not because the SNP have reacquainted themselves with the day job. It is because the SNP's Growth Commission has left the SNP's case for independence exposed. No wonder there are concerns about it. Uh, as the Institute for Fiscal Studies have made perfectly clear, this report marks a continuation of austerity. Not an escape, not an alternative, but a continuation. Let us look at why. Firstly, on the currency, the report states the Commission recommends that the currency of an independent Scotland should remain the pound sterling for a possibly extended transition period. That means an independent Scotland using what would have become the currency of a foreign country for an extended period. That would mean no control over money supply or interest rates and no power to issue debts to finance investment or to finance growth. And that would come with costs, severe costs. Pegging a new currency to the pound, uh, uh, for instance, would, according to Professor Macdonald of the Adam Smith Business School, require currency reserves of anything between 30 billion and 300 billion. On public spending, the Commission proposes a decade of cuts. They also propose that an independent Scotland would pay an annual solidarity payment to the UK, a payment that is bigger than Scotland's education and justice budgets combined. As the Labour Amendment states, the SNP have not engaged with Scotland's trade union on, on this report and on reading the document uh, and the scale of the cuts, it, that is evident. Mr Mackay didn't take any interventions. Presiding officer, the Grove Commission has much to say about the costs of Brexit. And Brexit does come with costs for both Scotland and the UK. Of that, there is no doubt. However, there is pre precious little to say in this report about the costs to Scotland of leaving the UK. Leaving a 40-year-old union is a big challenge, but so too is leaving a 300-year-old union, of which Scotland has been an integral part of for generations. It is time the SNP were up front about that. Presiding officer, the alternative to Tory austerity is not more austerity. It is an end to austerity altogether. A radical shift to a new kind of economy which mobilises the talents and resources of our whole country. An investment-led economy where we stop neglecting our infrastructure, our people and our industries and prioritise sustainable and inclusive growth in which businesses play by the rules and the rights of workers and trade unions are respected, where public services are run in the public interest, where we reassert the importance of public ownership and cooperative ownership so that there is more democratic control of things like Royal Mail and our railways. An economy that works for the many not the few. The change this country needs is a UK Labour government committed to ending austerity and the economic and social transformation of Scotland and the UK. And that is why I'll be voting for the Labour Amendment today and our vision of a better, fairer future for our country. Thank you, Mr. Bibby. Stuart McMillan. Um, I want to thank the for bringing out this important debate. I want to thank the other gentlemen for bringing this important debate to the Chamber uh, today and also their timing is very much impeccable. Uh, I will never demur from my belief that the only way we as a nation can actually even begin to reach our potential is by being an independent country. Now the other Dems in their various guises have campaigned for federalism for many, many years and it has uh, been rejected repeatedly at the ballot box. They didn't go away and change their policy and why should they if it's something that they believe so strongly in? And maybe then look at the issue of devolution and maybe then Willie Rennie in the summing up can actually explain why his party abstained or in Vera West in Hope House's case voted both ways in the House of Commons last night when they actually had a chance to try to protect the powers of this parliament against the face of a hard Brexit coming our way. Maybe he can explain why his federal colleagues, some of whom are Scottish MPs, decided to sidle up to the Brexit legislation, limiting this parliament's powers for up to seven years, even though Mr Rennie and three of his colleagues voted to protect this parliament's powers only very recently. Then we've got James Kelly's amendment in the parallel universe in which he obviously lives. We've got the weakest Tory uh, Prime Minister on record, and Labour are still behind him in the opinion polls. People attacked Michael Foote when he was the leader of the Labour Party. But I'm sorry to break it to Mr Kelly that Jeremy Corbyn isn't even a poor man's Michael Foote. Then we've got Labour's capitulation last night in the House of Commons, where they have also effectively given the Tories free reign to do what, what they want to this Parliament and also to Scotland. 
if leaving Scotland, if leaving Scotland to the excesses of even more people going to food banks, even more people struggling because of universal credit and the discredited pips, even more people affected by the rape clause, even more skilled migrants blocked from coming here to work in our health service, our farming sector, our fish processing sector, or our tourism sector, and many, many more examples than James Kelly and his colleagues have a lot of explaining to do now and also in the future. When our unemployment starts to go up, the cost of living starts to increase, the demands upon the Scottish Government start to increase, whilst the cuts from Westminster are an ever-present. How will his amendment then be delivered in the future, Mr Kelly? And you can answer that in your summing up. Also, uh, Mr. Uh, also, signing off, sir. Then we've got Murdo Fraser's amendment. This from the party that certainly didn't want devolution in the first place. If ever an example were needed, the events of our Tory administration in Westminster in 2010 have shown that the nasty party are well and truly back. They have, they've got the so called cuddly Scottish Tories to provide the human shield uh, from the vindictive policies emanating from Downing Street. They've got the extreme right wingers of Johnson, Gove, and Mogg dangling a weak Prime Minister like a marionette dancing to the hard Brexit tune. This should be a wake-up call to the people of Scotland that Westminster does not respect Scotland, it never has and it never will. When a Tory MP shouts suicide should be an option, when Ian Blackford MP asks the House of Commons Speaker what options are available, then this should tell, this should tell Scotland everything that we need to know about the nasty, vindictive Tory elite based in Westminster, but unfortunately available across all of the UK. Signing officer, this is why I will be back in the finance sector's amendment tonight, because anything less is doing Scotland a disservice and fails to recognise that when Scotland does become independent, we, the people of this nation, make the, will make it the country that we actually want it to be. Thank you very much. Thank you, and a particular thanks to uh, Neil Bibby and Stuart McMillan for getting us back on time. I call on Ross Greer to wind up for the Green Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to the Liberal Democrats for bringing the SNP's Growth Commission to the Parliament for debate. It's right that this place debates Scotland's constitutional and our economic future. But I've been absolutely bowled over by the brass neck of Willie Rennie to bring the motion that he did. It talks about a period of, an extended period of financial pain which is something that the Lib Dems know a great deal about, as other speakers mentioned. They are the junior architects of the round of financial pain that we've endured in this country since 2010. Their ideologically driven austerity has seen child poverty in Scotland and across the UK rise. Their Westminster coalition government implemented an agenda of cuts to public services of which around 80% of the damage was felt by women. So I am in no mood to take seriously Mr Rennie's lectures on austerity. While much of his criticism of the Growth Commission is not incorrect, his conclusion is wrong, and the Greens will obviously not be supporting his motion, and as a result, of course, not the amendment from the Conservatives either. But I found the, the Labour amendment quite interesting. I'd like to, to touch on that. Labour are, of course, right to criticise that the list of contributors to the Sustainable Growth Commission, allegedly sustainable, did not include a single trade union. In fact, you could say that uh, the client list of Charlotte Street partners would be delighted with the result of this document. And Labour criticism... Yes, I've not got time. Cabinet Secretary. It's just to make the point that the STUC was actually in the engagement strategy of the Commission. I was a member of the Commission and much of the work that the trade unions, I'm sure, would like to see are in the Growth Commission in terms of productivity and participation. So the thoughts of trade unionism you can see within the Growth Commission. Ross Greer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that remark, but no you can't. And the fact is not a single trade union was invited to contribute to the document on the same terms that the CBI was, that the Institute of Directors was, and that shows a failing on the SNP's part. Labour's criticism of the reheated neoliberal economics at the heart of the Growth Commission mirrors much of what the Greens have had to say. But the amendment in James Kelly's name is wrong to say that economic and social transformation cannot be achieved as a result of a referendum on independence. They're certainly wrong to say that only Labour's plans will bring about that transformation. We heard the same in 2014, that we should vote no because a Labour government was just over the horizon and it would undo the damage the Tories had inflicted on Scotland. Not only did that fail to materialise in 2015 and in 2017, and it doesn't look likely to materialise anytime soon, it's got worse with Brexit. Economic analysis commissioned by a committee this parliament found that we are set to lose 80,000 jobs in Scotland, a £2,000 drop in average wages as a result of a hard Brexit, which makes Labour's absolute capitulation to the Tories' hard Brexit utterly, utterly shameful. 
But the Labour amendment also fails to understand why independence is so necessary for Scotland. We do not want to put our future in our own hands simply because of the Tory government since 2010. We believe in independence because of the UK's structural long-term failure to act in Scotland's interests and because of the potential that independence has to bring about the social and economic transformation that the Greens and I believe many in Labour want to see. It's precisely because of that potential for transformation, though, uh, through independence, that the Greens believe the SNP's commission fails to offer either a compelling case for independence or an economic plan which meets Scotland's needs. Scotland needs independence to break with the failed GDP growth-obsessed crisis capitalism of the UK, to break with its dependence on and subservience to the financial sector in the city of London, to recognise the urgency of climate science and rapidly transition from an oil and gas industry bringing the world to its knees while it sheds jobs here in Scotland, and to build an economy which supports a renewed social contract, which transforms our society to the one that our communities deserve. The Green Amendment mentions our paper on jobs in the new economy, which pre uh, presents a vision for a jobs rich future for Scotland if we invest rapidly in the transition from fossil fuels to sustainable industry. And while the Greens believe that we don't have the answers, all the answers, just as no party here has all the answers, the vision that we contribute to this debate is one where Scotland, with all the powers of an independent nation, is fully committed to an economy of quality jobs underpinned by strong workers' rights and vibrant trade unions. We believe that Scotland's interests are best served if we take a different path, if we're brave enough to do things differently beyond simply voting for independence. But the first step, the very first step, is to put our future in our hands, and the Greens will proudly vote for that today. Thank you. I call on Neil Findlay to wind up for the Labour Party. Uh, thanks, President Officer. Andrew Wilson, the author of the SNP's Cuts Commission, is a former RBS banker, now a corporate lobbyist with Charlotte Street Partners, one of the most powerful and well-connected lobbying companies in Scotland. And it's important to understand that and know this because we can then begin to understand the philosophy behind his report. Wilson and his fellow commissioners who unanimously signed off the Growth Commission report, have penned a blueprint for independence which has ingrained in it a commitment to ultra-free market neoliberalism, fully endorsed, fully endorsed by Derek Mackay and Shirley Ann Somerville. The report is committed to current economic orthodoxy. There's no attempt to address external ownership of the Scottish economy, nothing on tax reform, nothing on challenging or controlling the hoarding of wealth that we see accumulated by the few at the expense of the many. The report was written exactly to lure in the people who are on Charlotte Street Partners' corporate client list. That's who this is aimed at. A pick and mix of policies from other countries, plagiarised reports are presented as a blueprint for a conservative economy. A Scotland of fiscal restraint of reduced and reducing public spending, a country whose interest rates and monetary policy are set by another state. It tells us a view of the world that says countries with low expenditure are doing better than Scotland within the UK, a Scotland that would no longer benefit from the Barnett formula, a Scotland where public investment would reduce year on year on year, and if accepted back into the EU at the same time, would be subjected to a 3% deficit as well as a solidarity payment. And all the while having no control over interest rates, monetary policy, with the currency controlled by the Chancellor of a foreign state in which we would have no political representation or influence in their parliament. This is not what voted, uh, motivated many to pound the streets for the Yes campaign in 2014. They are rightly infuriated by this adherence to a failed economic model that inevitably and purposely increases inequality. This is a betrayal of many of the people who supported the Yes movement in 2014. As Ian McWhirta, the Herald columnist, said, Nicola Sturgeon, who has always been thought of as a dedicated left winger, well, maybe, maybe he's I, maybe he's not, has found herself defending a document that reads in places like one of George Osborne's budget speeches. Robin McAlpine of the Commonweal, the commitment to deficit reduction programme, an incredibly low public debt ceiling and a commitment to peg public spending below the rate of GDP growth already has a name. It's called austerity. Not my words, but those of commentators who believed the SNP were a party of the progressive left. Well, this lays it bare, they are not. The Cuts Commission 
seeks to emulate countries like Finland, New Zealand and Sweden, but completely fails to acknowledge the social, economic and political history and culture of these states. States that have higher trade union density, higher taxes on the wealthy and where unions are active part partners in the economy. The SNP ignore all of that and instead want to create a low tax, low spend model. They're not interested in advancing serious economic change. The only change that they want to see is the change in the colour of a passport or a line on a map. And how on earth could we maintain a strong welfare state, afford pensions, the NHS and fund modern public services with public spending growing at 1% less than growth in GDP? In recent years, the SNP sought to attract working class voters by offering them a vision of independence very different from the current Tory UK government. This suggests that they have completely abandoned them in favour of the Sarangas Gross Arts of this world. The choice in Scottish politics is now between more cuts and austerity with the SNP or the Tories or a Labour Scotland delivering progressive policies, investing 20 billion in a Scottish investment bank worthy of the name, encouraging domestic ownership of industry, enough, cracking Henry. down on corporate tax avoidance, progressive taxation and a living wage of £10 an hour. Presiding officer, socialism and nationalism are very different political philosophies. This makes it even more clearer that they are. And can I call Adam Tompkins to wind up for the Conservative Party? Um, uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I was going to thank the Liberal Democrats for making their time available for this um, enlightening uh, debate, which I think has shown Holyrood in its best light, but I think perhaps the re allow the record to, the, to do that for itself. Uh, amid the noise, Presiding Officer, I think um, I have been able to pick out perhaps three uh, themes in this uh, debate. The first is that the core recommendation of the Growth Commission is fatally flawed. An independent Scotland using the currency of what would be a foreign power would be ruinous for the economy. It would be dangerous for political stability. Sterlingisation, which is its core idea, is a terrible idea. It's implausible, it's unworkable, and it is dangerously naive. It was rejected in 2013 by the SNP's own fiscal commission. More recently, it was condemned by former SNP MP George Caravan. Busted uh, as a credible um, option by uh, economists as diverse as Anton Muscatelli, Paul Krugman, Richard Murphy and Ronald McDonald. It wouldn't be a recipe even for independence, presiding officer. It would make Scotland more dependent on the monetary policy set elsewhere. Not elsewhere in the same state, but elsewhere in what would become the capital city of a foreign power. This is the core idea of the Growth Commission. No wonder Alex Bell described it as a political suicide note. So that's the first theme, flawed, hold below the waterline. The second, which is I think a more valuable purpose that the Growth Commission uh, has uh, undertaken, for which I thank them, is that uh, really its principal purpose has been to expose and to reconfirm just how threadbare the 2013 independence white paper was. As Murdo Fraser described it, a compendium of invention. Not just on the currency, presiding officer, on oil. The second oil boom, said Alex Salmond. The second energy bonanza, said Nicola Sturgeon. The massive oil boom, said John Swinney. The boom years ahead, said Nicola Sturgeon. And only now, four years on, the Growth Commission finally concedes how desperately misleading this all was. Windfalls should be treated as windfalls and not depended on for recurring annual commitments, it says. Yes, indeed. So too on pensions. So too on pensions. All of the uncosted fairy tale promises of the white paper torn up, jettisoned, dumped. So too on welfare, the same. U turn after U turn after U turn after U turn. So too on transition costs. They don't want to listen to this, do they? So too on transition costs, where the white paper was silent, where Nicola Sturgeon herself was hopeless on Channel 4 television just the other day, and where the Growth Commission is risible. £450 million to set up a new state, the IT to deliver capped payments in Scotland and the creation of a new Scottish Social Security Agency somehow more expensive than setting up a new state from scratch. What we needed was not a fresh blueprint for independence, but an apology from Derek Mackay and the troops assembled behind him for hoodwinking the Scottish people with a risible white paper in 2013.
the third and final theme, presiding officer, that, we, that has emerged from this um, high quality debate that we've all so much enjoyed this afternoon is perhaps the most important one. And that is that independence would make everyone in Scotland poorer. Independence would mean austerity on steroids. Debt would take 96 years to pay off. We'd see 27 billion pounds worth of cuts in the first decade alone. Business would flee. The economy would tank. Independence would mean even slower growth than we have under Derek Mackay's economy now, even higher taxes than we have under Nicola Sturgeon's SNP now. It would be a disaster for Scotland. Presiding officer, we said no. We were right, and we meant it. Can I call on Keith Brown to wind up for the SNP? Uh, thank you, President. Also, can I, uh, first of all, respond to some of the points that have been made during the course of the debate and also make the case that the best future for Scotland is an independent future? It's always a pleasure to make the case for independence for Scotland, even though it's talked about much more often in the opposition parties than it is in this party. First of all, the question is to ask, why are we having this debate now? And I think the cat has been let out the bag. In an article yesterday, Alec Cole Hamilton in The Scotsman admitted the fact that the prospect of the Growth Commission sent shudders of anxiety and nervous glances amongst the unionist parties. Yeah, exactly. yeah, we now, why. just to say that again, that the prospect of the Growth Commission sent shudders of anxiety and nervous glances amongst the unionist parties. In short, they are scared stiff of the idea of a debate about the positive and inclusive vision for Scotland. And so they should be. Because look at things as they currently stand. Foreign direct investment at a record level, 6,400 jobs. Export, exports are increasing hugely faster than the rest of the UK. RBS saying that growth in Scotland is projected to outpace growth in the UK. Employment in Scotland at record levels. Apprenticeship targets being met. As Ivan McKee said, record confidence in the prospects of an economic, uh, the, economic, the economy of an independent Scotland. That is what the unionists are so scared of. Yeah. And let's see some of the, the discussions. Very interesting. None of the major sportspersons want to take any interventions at all. That's quite a, a telling thing. First of all, uh, the Lib Dems that we have now from Alec Cole Hamilton, like Jo Swinson, this kind of ultra-unionist position. Jo Swinson's argued that she's pleaded with the Tory Prime Minister not to take any cognizance of the democratic mandate of this parliament. That's a Lib Dem person saying they should take no cognizance of this parliament's, uh, uh, of this parliament's decisions. Absolutely shocking. And not a word during the Liberal Democrat contribution about Brexit. Everybody knows, look at the daily record today, withdrawal is the number one risk to the economy. Not a word from the supposed supporting EU Lib Dems on the prospects of Brexit. Then we have Murdo Fraser, and this was back to the future, really. First of all, because some people might remember the programme The New Statesman in the 1980s. A certain character called Alan Bastard was the uh, star of that. And of course, he was an ultra right-wing conservative. And I just wonder if we've got a whole bunch of Bastards here today in this <laughs> chamber. And on the, issue, on the issue of engagement, it's also true to say we had a discussion today in the local com government committee of this parliament when the UK government did not turn up to talk about city deals. And I've just heard that once again, David Mundell has been in touch with this parliament to say he will now not appear before the Justice Committee of this parliament tomorrow. So much for the engagement from the Conservatives. Now, I'm sorry to have to do it to him, but James Kelly, no interventions, no suggestions, nothing positive to say. But it's worth remembering, this is the party, this, no I'm not, this is the party that ushered in, this is the party, this is the party that ushered in austerity. We all know what the last words of the Labour government were. There is no money left. The party that ushered in austerity for Scotland, the Labour Party. There was much to support in what was said, of course, uh, by uh, the Greens, both Patrick Harvey and Ross Green, in terms of the fact that it's a sustainable growth commission. We do have different ideas on this. We're perfectly willing to engage in a proper debate. And I have said that I'm more than happy to discuss with other parts of the Yes movement, including the Green Party, their proposals for the continued growth in Scotland. So this does seek to elevate the debate from the depressing Brexit-dominated a nightmare that we faced under the Conservative Party, especially after the votes that we've had in the House of Commons in the last couple of days. But, presiding officer, it's quite clear that the Unionist parties are riven, as Alex Cole Hamilton has said, by shudders of anxiety and nervous glances. And well, they might be, because this government 
this party and this country are united. Presiding officer, it might interest you to know that just this afternoon, the SNB has attracted 1,000 new members. Yeah. Just this afternoon. That says to me that people in Scotland have seen the way that Westminster fails to take and can never properly take into account the views of the people of Scotland. Presiding officer, the uh, country and this party are united behind trying to get a better future for Scotland. It's increasingly evident that support is widespread and I'm perfectly happy to take on the debate. We are ready and Scotland's increasingly ready for independence for Scotland. And could I call Willie Rennie to conclude this debate? Thank you. Uh, President officer, President officer, this has been a constructive debate <laughs> uh, with many considered and thoughtful contributions, including from that great thinker of the SNP, Keith Brown. He must learn to read, though, all of Alex Cole Hamilton's sentences rather than just the first half of them. We've had many great contributions, including from Derek Mackay, who has rejected UK austerity. Partly for him, it's not enough. They want even more austerity under the SNP. Murdo Fraser, Murdo Fraser quite rightly said this growth commission was a repudiation of the 2014 white paper, a compendium of inventions. And Tom Arthur, who I thought was rather unfair, he bellowed in the middle of the debate, we're doomed. Even I didn't describe the Growth Commission like that. <laughs> but can I seriously and genuinely, heartfeltly say I'm grateful that the SNP members have stayed for the whole of the debate. Um, I'm really touched that they wanted to listen to uh, my contribution at the end. Now, the SNP amendment is fascinating because if you actually look at the SNP amendment, it deletes all reference of many things in our amendment, and I can accept that they might not agree with everything, but they've even deleted reference to their own Growth Commission, such as the embarrassment about what the Growth Commission says. The Green Amendment um, has highlighted, I think, um, many of the divisions in the nationalist movement. Um, but if they really believe what they say, and I don't doubt they believe what they say, they will vote against the SNP amendment today. Exactly. Because if the SNP amendment passes, their Green Amendment falls. So if they have the courage of their convictions, yeah. they need to vote against the government amendment today. Otherwise, their words mean absolutely nothing. Ivan McKee was not comparing like with like when he looked back in terms of public spending. Under their rule, there would have been a 2% cut in real terms on public spending over the last period it would be an increase in the cuts, an increase in the cuts under the SNP. So he needs to be more accurate about it. People at the heart of the Yes campaign are furious. They're furious that the Growth Commission has confessed. They are upset that they won't be able to get away with what they told people last time. It's not about principle for them, it's about votes. Former senior MP George Kerevan warned that the Commission risked robbing the next independence campaign of working class support. Jonathan Shafi said it would be a very hard sell to voters. Colin Fox, he was alarmed. He said it risked driving hundreds of thousands of former Yes voters into the hands of Jeremy Corbyn. They are right to be concerned that the Yes campaign will hemorrhage votes because we now have the truth about independence from the Growth Commission. Several members mentioned Brexit, and you cannot criticise the Liberal Democrats on Brexit. We are forthright in our opposition to Brexit. And if only SNP members would have the courage and back the people's vote so that we can reverse the damage to our economy. But perhaps there is some common ground with the nationalists on that. But while I can, what I cannot understand is why those very same nationalists believe there will be no economic shock from withdrawing from the United Kingdom Economic and Political Union, especially when our in integration with the UK economy is even greater than that with the EU economy. To complain about economic shock from EU withdrawal whilst denying economic shock 
from the UK withdrawal defies logic. Yeah. The report would have been stronger if it had admit admitted that. We used to be told, we used to be told this repeatedly, that we'd be better off under independence. Yeah. But now, yeah. but we now, but now, we find we'll be stumping up billions for the UK for years after independence. Just like Nigel Farage promised us, we'll end up exactly the same with the SNP. The future of the NHS will be undermined by the weakness of the Scottish finances in an independent Scotland. So to be clear, to save the NHS, we need to remain in the United Kingdom. That is the best future for our country. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on finance and the Constitution. The next item of business is consideration of three business motions. Motion 12737, setting out a business programme, and motions 12738 and 12739 on timetables for two bills at stage one. If anyone objects, please say so now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau to move the motions. Formally moved. Thank you very much. And no one wishes to speak against them. The question, therefore, is that motions 12737 to 12739 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of four Parliamentary Bureau motions. Could I ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau to move motions 12742 to 12745 on approval of SSIs? Moved on block. Thank you very much. The next item of business is consideration of a Parliamentary Bureau motion. And could I ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 12741 on community right to buy abandoned, neglected or detrimental land, eligible land regulations and restrictions on transfers and dealing Scotland regulations 2018. Could I ask Formally moved. Move? Thank you. Um, I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to speak button now, and I call on Claudia Beamish. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, in, in these regulations, uh, regulations three to five set out matters which ministers must have regard to in relation to the physical condition, design, designation and classification and use or management of land. But it's regulation six that uh, Scottish Labour has concerns about, which we raised uh, in, the, in my Eclair committee, along with um, Alex Rowley. Regulation six, set, six sets out that matters to which ministers must have regard in relation to environmental well-being. They include whether the use of land has caused a statutory nuisance, whether the land is subject to a closure notice or a notice for antisocial behaviour. It also considers, and this is where the rub is for us, that whether harm is caused to environmental well-being. And this regulation as crafted is key to our opposition tonight. Having listened with care to the Cabinet Secretary and Committee, uh, when this came before us, I still have concerns, having been involved in the taking of evidence on the Land Reform Act in the previous session of this Parliament. Dr. Aileen MacLeod made the commitment at stage three in the Act saying, and I quote, I reassure members that the definition of environmental well-being has a wide meaning and encompasses some social considerations. It would have been helpful if the Cabinet Secretary could have clarified in committee the definition in law of harm of environmental to environmental well-being, which I understand made the Scottish Government decide to back away from the wide meaning which was in the draft regulations that are under discussion and have now been withdrawn. Those are the amenity and prospects of the relevant community, the preservation of the relevant community or its development, and the social development of uh, the relevant community. These are important issues for the future of our communities here in Scotland. And I, I absolutely take that effective regulation is important. So is regulation, which reflects commitments made by a minister at stage three of an act. That is why I have concerns that these three aspects uh, will have a detrimental effect uh, and, and are now only in possibilities. The cabinet secretary indicated to our committee that her officials are looking at the 2003 Act and Part 5 of the Land Reform Act 2016 in relation to sustainable development. These are complex issues. I am concerned that the, if the investigations don't come up with, a, with the, an answer that protects communities in these circumstances, the regulations will not be effective legislation that Dr. McLeod and those of us who were involved at in that process, including several stakeholders, were expecting. This would be to the detriment of community empowerment and risk curtailing the opportunities for communities, both rural and urban, to own more land for their future sustainable development. 
We need to get the regulation right, and a broader definition of environmental harm is needed. Thus, it is with regret, although I understand that we risk delaying this SSI tonight, but Labour members will be voting against it. Cabinet Secretary, would you wish to respond? Uh, thank you. These regulations introduce important new right to buy powers that will provide far-reaching options for communities. Communities will have the right to buy land that is wholly or mainly abandoned or neglected, or the management or use of which is causing harm to the environmental well-being of the relevant community. These are powerful options not currently available to communities. Before the draft regulations were laid, we had to remove some matters from ministerial consideration in determining whether the use or management of land results in or causes harm directly or indirectly to the environmental well-being of a relevant community. And these were elements not considered to be related closely enough to the concept of environmental well-being. Environmental well-being remains an important component of the regulations and includes some social considerations where they lead to harm to a community's environmental well-being. However, environmental well-being has a particular meaning and we cannot stretch that meaning to breaking point. Some stakeholders, particularly Community Land Scotland, were keen that such issues could be taken into account in determining whether land is eligible. But rather than trying to fit such concepts into the definition of environmental well-being, it is better to explore other options for how we might achieve this. I've asked my officials to look at ways in which that can be done effectively. This will be done during the course of the next year. Additionally, we will continue to monitor the effectiveness of the regulations we are discussing today. A report on the effectiveness of these regulations will be submitted to the Environment and Climate Change Committee by June 2019. I met recently with Community Land Scotland to discuss these regulations. Although they consider the definition of harm to environmental well-being to be narrowly drawn, they have given their qualified support to the regulations being passed in their current form, given the commitments I have made to explore other ways in which we can allow issues such as social immunity and social well-being to be taken into account. And these issues will also be relevant uh, in the context of Part 5 of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2016, which provides a right to buy for sustainable development and will be taken into account in developing those regulations. It is important to emphasise that as drafted, these regulations will bring into force valuable new rights to buy. They will provide communities with a powerful new tool to take ownership of land that is wholly or mainly abandoned or neglected and where the management or use of land is causing harm to the community's environmental well-being. If the regulations are not approved today, communities will lose this opportunity. So I would ask Parliament to support these regulations. Can I thank Ms Conninger for responding on behalf of the government. And we turn now to decision time. First of all, could I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Maureen Watt is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Annie Wells will fall. The first question is that amendment 12706.4 in the name of Maureen Watt which seeks to amend motion 12706 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton on health be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12706.4 in the name of Maureen Watt is yes, 62, no, 62. There were no abstentions. Uh, and as members will know, uh, as I've cast my vote before against uh, any amendment, I will cast my vote against this amendment. In this case, therefore, the amendment falls. So the second question is that amendment 12706.1 in the name of Annie Wells which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yes, we are agreed. The next question is that motion 12706.2 in the name of Anna Sarwar, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the fourth question is that motion 12706 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton as amended be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
were not agreed. We'll move to a division. I'll ask the question one more time. The fourth question is that motion 12706 in the name of Alice Cole Hamilton as amended be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to division. Members may cast their votes now. I think I'm going deaf. The result of the motion the, of the vote on motion 12706 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton as amended is yes 62, no 0. There were 62 abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. Now could I, could I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Derek Mackay is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Murdo Fraser, James Kelly and Patrick Harvey will fall. So the fifth question is that Amendment 12708.4 in the name of Derek Mackay, which seeks to amend Motion 12708 in the name of Willie Rennie on finance and the Constitution, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12708.4 in the name of Derek Mackay is yes, 68, no, 56. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The amendments in the name of Murdo Fraser, James Kelly and Patrick Harvey therefore fall. And the question is that motion 12708 in the name of Willie Rennie as amended on finance and constitution be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 12708 in the name of Willie Rennie as amended is yes, 67, no, 56. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. Now, I propose to ask a single question on four parliamentary bureau motions. If uh, anyone objects, please say so now. Good, no member has objected. The question is that motions 12742 to 12745 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 12741 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on approval of the community right to buy abandoned, neglected or detrimental land, eligible land, regulators and restrictions on transfers and dealings Scotland Regulations 2018 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on motion 12741 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick is yes, 103, no, 21. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move now to members' business in the name of Graham Day on banning the sales of energy drinks to under 16s. And we'll just take a few moments for the member and for the ministers to change seats.